This afternoon, I want to bring to us a word from the Lord that is titled, Apprehending Our Ascended Reality Through Sonship. I will try my very best to, to do what I can with um, this. I'm not, I'm not a preacher. <laughs> Thank you, sir and ma, for the opportunity to share the word of God this afternoon. I want to read from Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 7. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 7. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in their trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit thou now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. Hallelujah! By grace ye are saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Every one of us who is born again, who has de decided to give his or her life to Christ, has this reality seated in heavenly places with Christ, in Christ. In the heavens there are many places. There are places in Christ there are places outside of Christ. Paul talked about a third heaven when he said he knew of a man who went there and saw things. We know that at least biblically there are three heavens. The Bible talks about the firmaments as being the one. It talks about the realm of demons and principalities and powers as being the second. And then we know that the divine realm where the throne of God is seated is the third, at least biblically. But we know that in Christ, in the heavens in Christ, is where we, we dwell. If Christ is in you, and you are in Christ, therefore you dwell in heavenly places in Christ. The Lord needs to quicken our imagination to see this. The realm of our understanding to know this. Because it is what will determine if you are successful, even in spiritual warfare. Because the Bible tells us, Paul said to Timothy, wage a good warfare. A warfare that is waged goodly is one that is waged from the position of strength. It's waged from a position of knowledge. I've already won this. I'm enforcing victory. And so when we come through many trials in our lives, the Lord expects us to come with that consciousness, that conscious reality of where we dwell that we live and dwell in Christ in heavenly places in him. The Bible says that Christ is in the Father, as the Father is in Christ. And we are in Christ. So therefore, if Christ is hid in God, and we're hid in Christ, therefore, for the enemy to come to us, he first needs to get to God, and then Christ in God before he can get to us. That is the reality of our existence. But the problem is, a lot of the times we're not conscious of it. The Bible says that they that know their God, they will, are the ones who will be strong and do exploits. It's possible for you to have a stash of money somewhere and not know it, right? There are people who, I'm not sure if you've heard of some people who, maybe their grandmother left them inheritances that they never knew, and they worked as, you know, cleaners, not, not to, you know, deride, every profession is noble, but they worked jobs that were quite menial for most of their lives until they stumbled on their inheritance. A lot of the times we're like that too. 
a lot of the times the Lord has, as we've read, has given us many inheritances. The Bible tells us that we have so many in Christ. The, the Lord God is, is desiring to show us the exceeding riches of his grace. Through Christ, there are many, many deposits of grace that the Lord has given unto us. The Bible says it's the same grace that has appeared unto all of us. All men, all, all of all men. But it comes to teach us to depart from iniquity so that we can gain access to this realm of, of promises that God has made for us. He told Abraham and said to him, Oh, through you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But there are conditions to entering into such promises. Such blessings exist for the one who is conscious of their reality in Christ. We dwell with Christ in heavenly places. We're not of this world. Even when he was here, he would say, my kingdom is not of this world. He said before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham rejoiced to see my day even. So the Lord God, even as man, was very conscious of where he came from. He was not he was not uh, distracted by the things that were going on in life or the criticisms, the, uh, the, everything that people were doing to, to pull him down, to make him doubt his relationship with his father. The Pharisees came to him and said, oh, how could you claim to be the son of God? Our father Moses, Abraham, they've taught us the Torah. They've shown us the God that dwells in the heavens. How can you claim to in fact be his son. And Jesus at many times would respond and say to them, I am in my father and my father is in me. He said to Thomas, if you see my father, you see me also. The Lord God is in us by his Holy Spirit. Therefore, if the Lord God is in us, the Lord God wants to work in us to will and to do of his good pleasure on the earth today. And this is where we come in as sons. Galatians chapter 4. Can we have Galatians chapter 4, please? I am sorry I am speeding through the thoughts that are flowing. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. An heir to things, possessions. An heir is one who has the legitimate grounds or right of ownership over his father's possessions. He may not have worked for it one day in his life. Just as you and I never worked for the grace of God for one day of our lives. But the Lord God, as it says here in Ephesians chapter 2, has decided that in the ages to come, which is now, he has decided that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness, not because we merit it, not because we've done anything to justify the kindness of God, to show us such great love, bringing his inheritance unto us as children of light. And so, let's go back to Galatians chapter 4, please, verse 2. So the heir, as long as he is unconscious of his place, as long as he remains a prodigal, as long as he has not come to his own, as the Bible says the prodigal son did, as long as he remains with the swine and wasting and living a riotous lifestyle, he will be under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father, which means that there will be others custodying what should be rightfully his until he steps into his inheritance. But we're sons. We're sons of light. And the Lord expects us to move away from the foundational principles of the faith. He brings even now to me Hebrews chapter 6. So now let's go and see what's there. Hebrews chapter 6, please, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, 
not laying again a foundation of doing the same thing over and again without having the spirit of God powering our actions. Do you not know that sometimes it's possible even for us to gather together and for it to be dead? For it to be to constitute as, as dead works if it is not empowered by the Spirit of the Lord. But the Lord is calling us out in this day. It's a very strategic time and moment for the Lord God for sons to arise in the kingdom, to take their position at night and day to really understand what he's calling them out of and into. He's saying he's calling us to, to move away from laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, which means the things that we do that do not generate life, some sins that easily beset us, those weights in our lives that hold us back from really apprehending, coming into that fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ that God has called us into. It's your inheritance as is. It, it is mine. God has called us into a rich place in Christ. It's not given to the angels. The Bible says many of them desire to even look upon it to see. They desire to have what we have. In Psalm chapter 8, the question was asked of an angel, What is man that you are mindful of him? What is this creature that you so visit him? Why are you so preoccupied with this creature called man? You've made us angels to be, I mean, <laughs> angels are <laughs> angels. Are angels. <laughs> they are uh, angels. <laughs> And, you know, by any standard, a man might even want to be an angel because of how they you know, might think, oh, they look, they look angelic. I would just leave it as simply as that. And so, but, but the angels are asking prophetically through uh, David here, saying, but Jehovah, what is man? Why are you so preoccupied? Well, God is preoccupied with man because of the story of redemption. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Let's read from 18 to 23 really quickly. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, please. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestations of the Son of God, the sons of God. The Bible says that there's something that happened. Psalm 82 tells us that at some point, uh, David, David prophetically described the fall of man. Can we have Psalm 82 first so we can see? And then we'll come back to this scripture. Psalm 82, um, can you move on to verse 3, I think? Uh, let's see verse 5. Yes. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. After the fall of man, corruption came into the world. Uh, Romans chapter 5 gives us a very, I, I, I wouldn't read it now because we don't have time. It gives us a description of what happened with the fall of man. Through one man, Adam, sin came into the world. Adam's sin brought corruption into even the very body that we have right now. Everything that you see in nature, even the, the metal, is not embodying its, its glory. The glory that God had determined for it to have. The apples we eat, they're not in their real glory as God created them. Because corruption came and just diminished the glory of, of creatures. That's why, for example, if you go into the book of Revelation, you see that the lion will lay with the bear. There will be no, no animals eating each other because they will be restored to that glory that was in the beginning. But now we have mosquitoes doing things that they should, <laughs> they should not be doing. The Lord didn't make mosquitoes <laughs> to, <laughs> to bite <laughs> and give you malaria. <laughs> But uh, the Lord's goal is for us, embodying him through the Holy Spirit, to redeem not just humans, but every creature that exists on the planet. Why? Because it pleased 
the Godhead. Pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell bodily in Christ. The Bible tells us what that means is God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit dwelling in Christ. And think about it. If now, if you've confessed with your mouth, you believe in your heart, you've accepted the Lord Jesus, his spirit dwells in you. Do you believe that? <laughs> if the spirit of God dwells in you then, it means that there is something that the spirit of God is looking to accomplish through you. So it's no longer you that lives really. It's Christ, ideally, that should live in you. Because the life that you now live in the flesh, you have to live it by the faith of the Son of God who dwells in you. And he has a goal. He's had a goal from the beginning. Ephesians chapter 3, 11 tells us the goal of the Father is to bring everything up and sum it all up in Christ. It's to bring it all up into Christ, whether they are things that are of a celestial nature, things that, are, that we consider to be inanimate, things that are human in nature. The goal of all things is for Christ to be Lord of them. And our part in this process is to just let him do the work through us. And that's what sonship really means. The Bible says in John, I believe it's John chapter, I can't remember the scripture now, but Jesus many times would say, my meat is to do my father's will and to finish his work. I do what I see him do. I have no ambition. I have no goals of my own. It's really what pleases the father that pleases me. He mastered the, the technology of yielding to the spirit there. He really understood that there was a goal in the mind of God, a design that he was trying to implement on the earth. And for it to be accomplished, he had to yield. He had to put himself under so that Christ may increase and he may decrease, as Paul would say. So the goal for us as believers is to come away from a very fatalistic kind of approach that we're only concerned about making it to heaven. If, if, if that was all it took, then as soon as you, you're born again, Lord, you'd be like that thief on the cross. You're gone to paradise. But do we even know that depending on the works of righteousness, I don't mean works of your own self, but I mean, as James would say, the works that we do of righteousness, depending on what you do unto the Lord, your, your place in the heavens would, would be influenced by that. Like you will, the Lord honors you by the measure of your work. But the parables in scripture tell us that, the talents, for example, you get, you get this, you get that, depending on the work you give to the, to, the, the, to the kingdom. So my point is, for us as believers, the Lord is calling us away from a very narrow-minded thought process concerning our faith in Christ. He's not looking for us to come in and leave and just be concerned about whether or not we're, you know, still in the faith. That's good. That's the foundation, right, as we read. But he's calling us to attain onto real sonship. He's calling us to that, that real, that's the, that's the grand design. That's what answers the question, what is man? Because man can do what angels can't. Man can offer priesthood for the land to redeem the land from darkness. An angel, has, it has not been given to an angel to do that. But man has the ability to call down the influences of heaven, gives the Lord permission, if I may, to influence the realms of the earth from heaven. The Bible says whatsoever you decree and bind and lose on earth, the same also shall be done in heaven. We have a, we have, we have such a treasured place. If you don't remember anything, just remember that even angels desire to really know who you are. And so if we don't know who we are, as we read in Psalm 82, we're walking in darkness. The earth is groaning. Creation is groaning. The ground is groaning. Birds are groaning. We just maybe don't understand. Even earthquakes are groanings, calling for the redemption of the earth and creatures all around, whether the things that are in this realm or beyond, 
The Lord is calling us to be sons, to begin to legislate for the redemption of all things through Christ. It's not something that happens at the end of the age. No, it's something that the Lord is, is his son, as I've said, needs to come into the inheritances now. God hasn't given us those inheritances so we can eventually come into them when, we, when we're cut up with Christ in the sky. Then there would be no use for it because we would not have done anything on earth with them at the time. So the, the summary of my teaching this morning is, let us become conscious, first of all, of where we are. We're in Christ, in heavenly places in Christ. And then let us now begin to apprehend the responsibility that exists for us as children so that we're not like an heir who does not know what his father has given unto him. We pray, we fast, we do all of these things so that they can bring us closer to this reality daily. But we also need to maybe meditate on who we are. This reality of our ascension in Christ is very powerful. There are many uh, preachers that you might listen to that will tell you many of the times the way that they exercise the authority of God is to understand, come into that conscious reality of where they are. You, you, demon, you cannot come close because I'm in heavenly places in Christ. Because we are to influence from up, up above. The Bible says, seek those things which are above, right? All right, so I will stop here at this point. I really hope that the Lord has spoken to us in some way. I tried to really let him speak through me, and I hope that, I hope that I've accomplished that in some way. Um, let us pray. Let us uh, rise as we pray. Father, we bless you for this word. Thank you so much for, for the word you've brought to us because it pleased you for the fullness of the Godhead to dwell bodily in Christ. And if Christ is in us, then we have everything we need for life and godliness. But it comes with the knowledge, through the knowledge, through the knowledge. I'm praying the same prayer that Paul prayed even unto the people of Ephesus, that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened this morning so that we can come to apprehend the riches, the glories of our inheritance in the saints in Christ. For in Jesus' name I've prayed.